Hey everybody, Aaron Count, Sage Dynamics, and this is the B.E. Myers Mall. Not everybody's gonna be familiar with the name B.E. Myers. I'm familiar with them because I used a lot of their laser products in the military. And that's what they're known for. They make awesome laser products. And the mall is their introduction to an IR and visible laser aiming device. Now, there are arguably not that many options when it comes to IR slash visible laser devices uh, for shooting or night vision on the market when compared to other categories such as optics or visible red lasers that you find for handguns, rifles, things like that. Uh, the reason is the demographic of people who use night vision is arguably smaller than the, well, I wouldn't even say arguably, it's going to be smaller, almost always smaller than the uh, category of people who don't use night vision but just shoot under daylight or even low light conditions. Uh, it is kind of a niche market when compared to uh, the other side of the house, so to speak. So whenever a new laser device comes along, IR laser device comes along, uh, it's going to get a lot of scrutiny, probably because those people who shoot under night vision are expecting a product to perform very, very well uh, under adverse conditions, because the majority of the demographic of people who use night vision use it professionally, military, law enforcement. That doesn't mean that a new product can't come along and be awesome, but the scrutiny, I'd say the... the, uh, the level of expectations is going to be much higher uh, and much less forgiving when it comes to the product's performance. Because of that higher level of expectation, when I got them all, I knew I was going to spend some considerable time with it. This wasn't going to be a, a normal review process for me. If you're familiar with the channel, almost everything gets a 2,000 round review process. Um, I can't think of anything firearms related I've renewed, uh, reviewed in the recent past two, three years that didn't get that 2,000 round process. The mall was gonna be different. I wanted to use the mall for an extended period of time for two reasons. One, because it's, it's a revolutionarily new product, arguably. Um, and two, because of the inherent cost associated with the, uh, the optic. These things are not cheap and that's fine because you pay for quality. So at the end of the review process, if it, if it came out performing as well as I hoped it was going to perform, then the cost was going to be not as large of a significant factor because when we factor in what we're actually talking about, a device for the using night vision, the night vision category, the night vision demographic isn't cheap anyway. This particular mall is the C1 Plus, which is the non-restricted laser. If you're not familiar, there's non-restricted and then there's restricted lasers. One of the most prevalent uh, IR illuminator, IR lasers out there, the PEC-15, is a restricted laser. Now there is a, there is a unrestricted version, the Atapal C, but most people know the PEC, they recognize the PEC, they understand the PEC-15, they may have seen the PEC-15's performance either on videos or in person, or maybe they have one. Um, so that's considered um, almost like a benchmark of sorts, even though it's a restricted laser. So for the average person, unless you find one secondhand on eBay or through Gunbroker or something like that, 
Uh, if you're not military, not law enforcement, you don't have a letterhead, you can't just go to L3 and buy a PEC-15. Then you get into the non-restricted side of lasers, which most commonly you see Steiner products, such as the D-Ball. D-Ball is pretty good, but it is a non-restricted laser, which means, at least arguably in the past, the performance wasn't going to be as good as what you're getting from the restricted side of the house, such as the PEC-15. I don't think anybody would debate that a, that a PEC-15 will outperform a D-Ball A3. Uh, the reason being, one's restricted, one's not restricted. Now, a restricted laser can put out more power, and that's why it's able to perform to the degree that it does. But B.E. Myers, especially with the C-Plus, was like, well, why can't we have a non-restricted laser perform just as well, reasonably speaking, as a restricted laser? Two reasonable expectations of performance. Uh, visible laser, uh, obviously a little bit easier to do, but there are restrictions on visible laser, being that the sun is a thing, and there aren't too many lasers on the face of the earth bright enough to overcome the power of direct sunlight so it can be used during daylight. But indoors, low light conditions, and obviously at night, uh, your laser is going to be good to go. The mall went with green, which uh, some people say it doesn't have the same battery life, and, and of course there's an operating temperature issue between it and a red laser. That's okay. Uh, and then of course there's the IR category, which is the IR laser and hopefully the IR illuminator. The mall does have both. You want an IR laser that can allow you to put the beam on whatever you're trying to shoot at whatever reasonable distance you're shooting at. But you also want an illuminator to reach the same distance. And this has been a failing with a lot of non-restricted lasers in the past where the laser itself, your actual IR illuminator, or I should say IR laser, would reach out to 200 yards, but your illuminator falls flat on its face at like 50, 75, maybe 100. If I have a rifle capable of reasonably shooting and if I reasonably shoot out in the daytime to two, three hundred yards, I want my laser, my IR laser under night vision to be able to do the exact same thing. And historically, this is something we have only been able to get from your restricted lasers, your military, law enforcement, restricted purchase lasers. So when I first saw them all, I was like, okay, the, 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 the restricted version is going to be awesome and then the non-restricted version is not going to be so good. And when I got one, I was hoping that wouldn't be the case, but that's what I was expecting because that's what I've gotten from other lasers in the past. Before we get into performance, let's talk features real quick. One thing that definitely sets them all apart as you're looking at it uh, is it, uh, it mounts a little bit differently. Maybe something you're a little uh, unfamiliar with. It's mounted uh, high and off the side, that um, one o'clock position, maybe 1.30. 145 if you want to get really really specific you got two main fire control buttons a primary and a secondary mode then you have uh, Your mode switching which means you have a CQB a mid-range and a long-range setting which we'll get specifically into and then you have your uh, Control wheel you know, which is your off your visible and your IR all of these controls can be easily manipulated under night vision So you don't actually have to get any visual input you can memorize how things are supposed to feel based on the settings or you can memorize positioning and turn to that. You don't actually have to screw around with a whole lot of buttons and switches. One of the things that's aggravated me about some lasers in the past is they have 19 settings and I only use two of them. The mall has a very simplified process of settings. You've got three output settings with two different modes per setting, and you've got off, visible, and IR. Very simplified process to actually give you what you want. And what probably lends itself very well to that being the case is the fact that the IR laser and the IR illuminator are slaved together, which to me is my favorite feature. The zeroing process in the mall is pretty idiot proof. They provide you with a, uh, a zeroing target that you can use and you can refine later. Now, because of the design of the mall, they recommend a parallel zero. Some of you may not be familiar with parallel zero. If you're in the military, you, depending on what time you were in the military, uh, you might be familiar with parallel zero. Basically, the parallel zero says, the laser shall be parallel to the zero of the rifle's optic uh, at consistent distances. So there's no real holdover issues or uh, two axis parallax that you're gonna have to worry about of what you get from a converging zero. Converging zeros are what mostly what you see with visible lasers, traditional zeros, is you zero your visible laser to wherever the optic is at a certain distance. So if I have a 5200 zero on my optic, I'm going to slave my laser to the optics dot uh, during the zero process. Problem with that is once I'm inside of or outside of that 5200, I've got two axis parallax because the laser is not in line with the bore uh, and it's pushing across and up or down depending on the zero distance. 
the mall set up ideally for a parallel zero which is the zero i use throughout the review process i'm I was familiar with Parallel Zero. Uh, I've always been a fan of the Converging Zero because I don't give up too much in realistic distances. But I'd never had, um, outside of the the, the PEC 15 I had, the PEC 15s I have, and the PEC 15 I use in the military, uh, I've never had a non-restricted laser or just a laser in general that lended itself so well to a Parallel Zero. And I also have never had a non-restricted laser that allowed me to shoot as far as the uh, the C plus does, C1 plus does. So when you start shooting extremely, I wouldn't say extremely, longer ranges with an IR laser, you start to have more of an appreciation for the parallel zero over the converging zero because you're able to reach out and hit much, much further away. Getting right into uh, the specs, your visible laser is uh, five milliwatt, which uh, pretty standard. Um, obviously there are regulations that, that, that kind of dictate for a non-restricted laser how powerful those lasers can be. Uh, I found the green laser to be green. Uh, it's very, very bright in regards to the milliwatt range that, that you're getting out of it. What to me was the most appealing thing about the visible, and I'm not a huge visible laser fan when it comes to shooting. I think it has its niche, it has its purpose, but it's not something I'm going to default to and it's not something I'm going to run over my optic unless there's a reason that I have to, such as using a gas mask or something like that. Uh, but the divergence on the beam, if you're not familiar, there, every laser is going to have some degree of divergence, which means, relatively speaking, the beam grows in size the further away it gets from the emission source, which is a good thing when you think about shooting longer distances, because if, if the beam remained the exact same size as the emitter, if you're looking at like a 0.3 or a 0.5 MRAD uh, dot, or if you can go even smaller than that, um, if it was that same size at distance, you might be able to lose it very, very easily, especially a visible laser in lower light conditions, but not quite dark conditions. So while the divergence is still there, divergence is something we're always probably gonna have on lasers, it's not, what I would consider a blooming divergence, which means when I'm using the laser at extended distances, say 50 yards, 100 yards, it's not giving me like a 12 MOA point of aim. I'm still getting the ability to be precise with that visible laser. The IR laser is 0.7 milliwatt, well, milliwatts on all settings, which if you're familiar with, with how milliwatts work and, and relates to, to uh, IR devices, or you just you know the numbers, so to speak, uh, that doesn't sound like a lot. And uh, compared to a restricted laser, you know, something pushing like 20 or 40 milliwatts, it's not. It's not the milliwatt, it's how it's projected. Just like with the visible laser, the IR laser's divergence is very, very minimal. Uh, and it's able to project very far. And when you factor in that the uh, laser illuminator is slaved to your IR illuminator, you get a one, a very easy optic to use, because as you zero the laser, uh, you're zeroing, in, in effect, your IR illuminator. Um, you're getting something that allows you to project without too much of a concern over creating photonic barriers by having your laser and your illuminator uh, not co-aligned, not zeroed correctly, um, or the fact that traditionally, and, and with some other devices, your IR illuminator is not actually a laser, it's an LED. Uh, and that can create problems with photonic barriers as well, depending on the quality of your night vision. So that 0.7 milliwatt laser, uh, you're looking at 0.5 mils of divergence. During the review process, during oh, almost a year I've been using this thing, I was able to shoot close range out to extremely long distances. Uh, it's been riding this PWS Mark 111 11-inch gun the entire time. Uh, once I had my Parallel Zero locked down, it was anything for me to be able to put this thing on target with PID and illumination from my illuminator, which is just as important, 150, 200, even out to 300 yards. Because the uh, field of view, if you will, or the, the, the actual uh, tightness of the beam of the illuminator changes when, when if you're on your short range CQB, arguably, your mid or your long range, that illuminator is gonna change its focus uh, tied to the laser at those different distances. So it really helps you hone in the laser on what you're trying to shoot. Putting this, and again, I'm not big on comparisons, but it's gonna be brought up because guys think that, you know, I can just jump on eBay or jump on Gunbroker and buy PEC 15. Why do I need a mall? Um, 
So the comparison needs to be made there because the PEC-15 for a while has been considered the standard, even though the PEC-15 is a restricted laser, like I've already said, this is an unrestricted laser. Um, this thing has just as just the same ability uh, when it comes to being able to PID and being able to reach out as PEC-15 does. I didn't see any performance difference between the two. The only thing that you can visibly notice as a difference between the two is the PEC-15 has more divergence. Um, and on its high output setting, the PEC-15, the entire beam under IR will be visible, whereas on the mall, unless there's particulates in the air, it won't. You just get the dot at where you're trying to shoot, which I've always kind of been a fan of not having a giant beam of light, a lightsaber, if you will, uh, projecting back to where I'm coming from, if, if that makes any sense. It's almost like a tracer, but constant on. I mean, it's super cool to have your little lightsaber effect on your rifle. What's cooler than that is not having someone to be able to easily trace that line back to where the little rifle is, where I am. Uh, so I definitely appreciated that about the, uh, the mall's output. Same degree of performance, though. I can shoot out to 300 yards on my PEC-15, shoot at 300 yards on my Mall C+. The biggest difference between the two as the purchaser is uh, if you buy a PEC-15 secondhand off of eBay or Gunbroker, if it breaks, you're pretty much screwed when it comes to sending it in for warranty services. Where if my mall goes down, well, I'm allowed to actually have this because it's an unrestricted laser, so getting it serviced wouldn't be a problem. Like I already said, functionality, the ergonomics of the mall, uh, you memorize the controls very, very quickly. It's as simple as hand placement making or manipulations. Uh, when it comes to durability, one of the concerns that, that was brought up to me when people would see it is like, well, it's, it's, it's not 12 o'clock or 6 o'clock mounted. Traditionally, your, your, uh, your IR lasers are 12 o'clock mounted if the rifle and the rail length and, and the mission supports it. So this one's mounted off to the sides. So people say, well, you know, if the rifle goes down, you drop your rifle, do this. This has been on the rifle for over a year. It's taken um, the occasional uh, spill. Uh, it's been knocked against door frames. It's been knocked against glass. It's been knocked against cars. It's been knocked against uh, support pillars in vehicles, working you know, your CQB shoot house settings and then in vehicle classes. And it's been in mud and rain. It's been in cold temperatures. It's been in extremely hot temperatures. And it's still doing great. Uh, I have not been able to knock it out of zero during that process. I do periodically check the zero, especially when I swap the battery because I wanted to see if it would maintain zero. I couldn't think of any reason why it wouldn't because the battery swap process doesn't require you to, change, to actually remove it from the rifle. Uh, but I wanted to see if maybe somehow I was going to create any kind of zero or loss of zero issues with just the functionality of the laser itself, and I wasn't able to do that. Uh, I don't really have anything bad to say about them all. For those of you who run white phosphor night vision, another cool thing I think is it has an alternate setting which kind of changes the internal programming, if you will, so your laser and your illuminator are finally more finely tuned to the acceptable ranges you get for white phosphor versus green phosphor. And I thought it was cool that they included that, especially considering white phosphor is kind of where everybody is going um, for you know their own personal or unit or, or doctrine reasons. Uh, but because I'm a white phosphor fan, I prefer it over green phosphor for night vision. With my Vipers or my, uh, my PVS-15s, this thing is very, very vibrant. The Maul has a minimal footprint, relatively speaking, and it is reversible. You can actually take the front, put it on the back, back, put it on the front, so you can swip around if you're a left-handed shooter. It does lend itself to the 12 o'clock mounting position. However, if you wanted to, you could mount the uh, control panel off to the 3 or the 9 if, if you had some kind of specific mounting issue. That would create some issues with, with uh, beam and, and bore height relation, uh, relatively speaking, depending on the rail you're using, but I think that'd be that big of a deal. Working other accessories around it hasn't been a problem. Uh, right now I have an HLX underneath it. I'm not running a Surefire Scout or a Surefire Vampire, especially the Vampire, because I don't need it. The Illuminator on this thing is so great, there's no need. I Now I have my, I don't have to compromise on my weapon light, my visible light, to have IR output as well, which is something you may have seen with lasers in the past because their Illuminator sucked. The Illuminator in the mall is so good, I can go back to my standard full output one spectrum light. So now I'm getting all my white light capability right underneath, snugly tucked underneath all my IR laser and Illuminator capability. So do you need the mall? Do you need the C1 Plus? Uh, depends on how serious you are about night vision shooting. Uh, night vision is, is not a, a budget game. If you get into budget night vision, you realize very, very quickly that you shouldn't have done that. You should have saved your money and gotten something better. Uh, there's different levels, I guess, of people who shoot in night vision. Some people own a single PBS-14, for example, or, or a 
comparable product like something from ATN or something like that and then maybe they'll use it occasionally or maybe they never really shoot with it they just use it to walk around or, or just because like hey I want to have night vision I can afford to have at least this type of night vision I like to have it just in case uh, then this is probably isn't for you but if you're serious about shooting under night vision it's something you do four five six ten fifteen twenty times a year depending on what you're into if you do a lot of uh, night vision hunting like for hogs or something like that uh, you need them all. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and say that. It's the best non-restricted laser I've ever seen and it performs as well or better than some of the restricted lasers that are on the market because of the way that the circuitry and the, in the, the way that the beam is tuned and projected. Uh, a lot of thought went into this. I've put this up against the Mall DA, and the, the only difference that I was really able to see is on that super or that long range setting. That's where the two really set their set each other apart. On the mid and the short range settings, I personally did not see a huge difference, a difference that was appreciable between their two performance. So some people are trying to hold out to try to grab up a restricted DA. One, that's probably not gonna happen for years and years and years and years and years because there's just not enough of them out there to one to fall off some military truck and for you to be able to buy it on eBay. And even if you did, you're technically not supposed to have it, even though I don't see any reason. I think the laser restrictions that are in place are ridiculous and we shouldn't have to deal with restricted versus non-restricted lasers, but the law being what it is. Um, if you're gonna dedicate a lot of your, your personal income to really high quality night vision, such as dual 14s or 15s or 31s, don't skimp on your laser. Uh, your 15s, your 31s, your dual 14s, your white phosphor tubes will appreciate the fact that you're pampering them with a high quality aiming laser so when you do shoot under night vision, you actually hit what the fuck you're aiming at. I did my best during this video to be able to capture the performance of the mall on video. Unfortunately, filming night vision, if you don't already know, is super problematic. Not because you can't mate a camera to night vision, but because cameras don't really film the same uh, contrast that you get with actual night vision. So in certain videos, it seems like the laser of the mall is lost in the illuminator or the laser is not performing as well uh, based on the relative brightness of the situation. Any other number of factors you may have noticed in the video. And that's just one of the problems of trying to film night vision. It's very problematic to do, which is why Hollywood usually just uses some kind of filter and they make it look a lot cooler than it is in real life. Um, so that being said, if you're able to get out and get get behind one of these to test drive them, I highly encourage it. If you're in the market for a high quality IR uh, illuminator slash laser, it doesn't get any simpler, any more intuitive, and any more functional and any higher performance currently available than the Mall uh, C1 Plus. I'm Aaron Count with Sage Dynamics. Train accordingly.